for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday morning, May the 25th, 1984. Memorial Weekend Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Lily and Art Johnson are the speakers of the morning. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything, is there anything too hard for me? Behold, I am the Lord. You may be seated. You know, sometimes, and I expect here as well as other places, that the presence of the Lord will come in such a way that we'll not be able to be seated. You either stand or you'll fall flat on your face on the floor, one or the other. I believe that. And I expect to see it not only here but across the nation. Amen. Amen. And a continuing manifestation of that power and presence of God in our presence. I believe that when the presence of the Lord begins to be poured out again in that power, in that race, that it will never be lifted. That it will come and it will stay and abide. But also with that will come persecution and those who will ridicule and rise against and even, if possible, even kill us. But we will, with the presence of the Lord will be manifest and come forth and God will be victor. There will be casualties. There will be casualties, but the casualties will point to Jesus. Amen. Amen. His power and His presence shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. He's raising up a remnant who believe that all things are possible in the name and the authority of that name, Jesus and that all authority and dominion and power has been given unto those who believe. Hallelujah. And I want to believe. O oh Lord, help thou mine unbelief. Help thou our unbelief, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us. That we can believe and be believing believers. It is written, Thus saith the Lord, health and life and strength and restoration and even resurrection in the authority and the power and the dominion in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that. I believe that. Some think, you know, that's it's all right. I still believe it. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to, but I believe it. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I thank the Lord for believing believers. Hallelujah. And He's, there won't be a lot. There's only a remnant. There's only a remnant. But in that remnant rests the manifestation and the power of the seven spirits of God. It will rest in them, and they will do exploits for our God that no man can gainsay, and he will be glorified. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. 
Praise the name of the Deliverers on Mount Zion. He's raising up to bring deliverance to his people and then to creation. But first it must come to his people. It must begin in the house of the Lord. It must begin with you and I. We must desire, we must seek, we must desire to be holy and righteous before the Lord. We must desire that more than we desire life. We must desire to be righteous and holy before the Lord so that He can work and move and flow through us in a dominion and a, and a manifestation that we have yet to know or to understand or has yet been known except in the days of the early church, in the days of the persecution of the early church. In the catacombs it was found. And that, and that is coming back to us. Persecution is not new. It hasn't been, it's, it's been present in this, in this generation, persecution. Not, as, not here in America, but it's, it's been in other parts of the world. Persecution has been. And there's been millions, millions. There's been, there's been millions more killed in the last 20 years or 25 years for, for the namesake of Jesus than was ever killed back through the early time of the early church. In fact, many times more. And yet we... Don't even think of it or, or even realize it. A lot of us don't even realize it, that it has happened. It ha but it has happened. But out of the midst of it is coming forth a church that's glorious without spot and wrinkle, declaring holiness unto the Lord, holiness unto the Lord, holiness unto the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Jesus. You can be a bridesmaid if you want, bridesmaid if you want to, but I'm not interested. You can be part of the bridegroom company if you want to, but I'm not interested. I'm interested in the bridegroom. Hallelujah. I don't want to be part of the party who comes to be part of the wedding party. I want to be part of the bridegroom company. Hallelujah. We've heard so much about the virgins and the virgins and being part of the virgins. Well, that's fine. We need to be a virgin. But there's many steps beyond that. There's the bride, there's the bridesmaids, and then there's the bride, but then there's the bridegroom. There's the best men. All of those have a place, and they're all a, a company of people. But I'm interested in the bridegroom. Hallelujah. He is who is worthy to be praised. To him be dominion and power and authority and glory forever and ever and ever. Jesus is his name. Jesus is his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your Praise your Lord. Hallelujah. Lily, I think you should come and minister. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. He's here. He's here. He's here. As my husband said last night, it's good to be where he is. Get to the right place at the right time, as our brother Egan said, and be where the Holy Spirit is. Arrive when he arrives. He's here, and we want him to continue to have our hearts open to what he's saying. I once heard someone say that God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. But do you know what? God said it, says it, and that settles it. Exactly. It's going to come to pass. So let's believe it. Let's believe it and flow with it, because we're in the right pathway then. We're on the right road. Last night, there were, uh, through our brother Bell and our brother Agin and my husband, there were several uh, references to the, uh, the three realms, uh, the 30, the 60, the 100, the outer court, the middle court, and the inner court, and our progress from uh, our uh, salvation or our born-again experience in the outer court to the middle court where we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then as we go on into that holy of holies where we surrender all to him and he is all and in all. And I'd like to just elaborate and give a little more insight into this from a scripture here in the Old Testament. I'd like you to turn to Second Kings chapter 2 this morning. And there's many levels of revelation on this particular uh, little discourse about Elijah and Elisha. But I'm going to share with you one that the Lord revealed to me some time ago. And I want you to know that the plan for going on with the Lord is, is our choice. I believe He's speaking to everyone. I believe He's speaking to every Christian, drawing them on unto Himself. But it's a choice that we need to make. And you know it's not always going to be easy. 
some years ago, a book came out by Watchman Nee. It was called Against the Tide. You know, if you're here today, you're going against the tide, not only of Satan and of the world system and of the religious system, but of much of Christianity. It will be a choice that will be against the tide. And therefore, there's that pressing on, there's that battle. Is there not? That's right. Because you're going against the way that is the natural inclination of the world and even the pull of our own natural carnal mind and the pull of the flesh. And I'd like to exhort you through this and, and see the challenge and, uh, that God has through this chapter here. Uh, uh, I'm going to read part of this, and as I read it, I'm going to just unfold it, how the Holy Spirit unfolded it to me. And if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, He will probably speak to you on levels and ways that He didn't show it to me, and He'll give further understanding and revelation because you know nobody has it all. Praise God. This uh, scene that we're going to talk about here is the last day of the life of Elijah. And at this time, he visits three places. He visits Gilgal, he visits Bethel, he visits Jericho. And these have been tre tremendous places in Israel's past, places of triumph, places of victory. And Elisha has been following him for now about ten years. And sometime before uh, this passage, Elijah, Elisha told Elijah, I will follow thee. I will follow thee. And now comes his test. I don't know about you, but my husband and I, every once in a while we get in a situation and it's sort of like the, the Lord begins to close doors. In fact, he closes them. It's just like a funnel. You just got one way to go. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. And I said, Lord, you know, everyone out there has choices. And he lets me know that we have already made our choice. And if you're here, probably somewhere in your life, whether you have said it verbally to the Lord or just at a desperate time in the inner recesses of your heart, spoke it from your heart and God heard it, you've told him you'll go all the way. You've said, Lord, whatever it takes. He said, Lord, something to that effect, I want to be yours. I want to be yours. And do you know what? He takes up that prayer. He has waited for that. He's waiting it for all of Christianity. He takes up that prayer by the power of his Holy Spirit, and he begins to take your life and move and cause it to come to pass. And some of the strange things that we experience, and as I counsel and pray with people and Christians, I mean, truth is stranger than fiction. Some of the things that we go through and the experiences we have, but I want you to know, he has an end in mind. He has an end in mind, and it's the fullness of himself. That's right. That's right. It's the full inheritance in Christ Jesus. And so... Like Elisha, I, I think of him as a disciple or a follower here. Uh, maybe you've heard other versions of this, but this is how the Holy Spirit unfolded it to me. And I think of Elijah here as a type of our Lord and Elisha as a follower. And it says in the verse 1, it says, And it came to pass. I like that. Our brother spoke a lot about time last night at the appointed time. You know, God has a timetable that moves on. And there is, there's a point of time, and the time comes to pass. It's not just one day after another. Things are happening, and we need to flow with what's happening. And so it says it came to pass when the Lord would take up, this was his appointed time, would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. On the last day of his life, he's going to take his disciples to these various places that have been experiences, and he's going to test him. Now, I think of uh, Gilgal as a place, uh, it says in the scripture that it's a place of victory. It speaks in certain places of it being a type of the cross. I think of this as our salvation experience, right, where that was victory 
over our sins. Victory. That's where Christ won the victory. And it says that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And what he's showing him and what the Lord wants to show us is that these experiences, we need to go through each one of these steps. You don't move from the outer court to the inner court, you know. You don't make any jumps. It's a progression. It's a progression. And each place is a good place. But the problem is people stay there. People stay there, and that's the problem. You know, there's something about the, the uh, human nature, the atomic nature in each one of us. We like to be comfortable. We like to be comfortable. We found our little niche. It's a nice group of people, or it's a nice church, and they're friendly, and all of this. And there's a tearing away with each move, is there not? Anything that creates uh, a change in our life, we don't, we don't want. We want to just be comfortable. The natural man wants to settle down. And we have to recognize that as a, as a, as a uh, characteristic of the flesh life. And that's why we have to yield to the Spirit, continually drawing us unto Him. And Elijah said unto Elisha, verse 2, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. I looked up that word, and it means to stay on at a certain place and to linger. To just linger on. That's right. I lingered at this place for years, and that's because I didn't know there was any other place in God. I'm not talking about a physical place. I'm talking about an experience in God. I lingered there for years. I didn't know there was any more. My sins were forgiven, and I, if I died, I knew I'd go to heaven right that's right and so without a vision we don't know anymore but that's why we need to study this word and see you know there's a group in revelations and it says these are they that follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth are they not and there is a group that's going to follow him wherever he goes he says where i am there shall also my servant be we want to be with that group. So he's giving him a choice. He says, tarry here. I'm, bu- I'm going on. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And so they went down to Bethel. Now Bethel represents the house of God. It represents the dwelling place of God. And I kind of felt that the Holy Spirit was saying, this represents the next stage, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when he says, my spirit will come and it will dwell with you and be in you, you see, and he will dwell with you forever. This is that close place of communion that Bethel, I believe, represents in the scripture here. And he says, I'm going down to Bethel. And so he gives him a choice. And it says, so they went down to Bethel. Verse 3, And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. I want you to notice here, as soon as you move on, there's going to be someone discouraging you. That's right. That's right. When he moved on, someone came to discourage him and create that sin that does so easily beset us, which is unbelief. What's going to happen to you when he takes away Elijah? You're going to be out there all alone, right? Creating fear, anxiety, and unbelief. You know, this, these sons of the prophets, they were not the heathen. That was their Sunday school class. That was the Bible study. They were. That was the little church. That's right. That's right. The ones that hinder is a group you just left. Always. I really don't have a whole lot of problem with the world. That's right. They don't know enough to even know what I believe to be against me right now. But the group that you just left is the one that will put pressure and hinder and draw you back. And you need to be aware of this. If you're not aware, you'll say, maybe I'm not hearing from God. Maybe this baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't of the Lord at all. You know, they say that it was for the dispensation and all of this. And they say speaking in tongues is this and that. Don't believe them, you see. Don't believe them. And so 
I notice how nice Elisha, he's short and quick to the point. He says, yea, I know it, hold ye your peace. He doesn't argue, he doesn't debate, he doesn't strive. You know why? He has his eye on the mark. He knows where he's going. Scripture says, then shall they know if they follow on to know him, to know the Lord. Then that shall they know. Let's go on here. Verse 4 says, And Elijah said unto him, Tarry here, I pray, he, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And so they came to Jericho. Now Jericho represents a place of tremendous victory over the enemy. Does it not? Jericho was a stronghold of the enemy. And I think of this maybe as a, a place of deliverance. They were going on for deliverance. And it says there, the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elisha said unto him, I pray thee, hear, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. You know, I want you to know something. Our brother Stephen Bell said something very good last night. I don't know if you heard it, but I did. And it's very important for all of us here who are coming for deliverance. We need to partake. We need to receive. We need to be delivered. But if you camp at Jericho, where the strongholds have been taken down and say, Wow, I'm sure glad I'm finished with that. I'm sure glad that's off my back. Right, that giant's out of my life. That's another place you can settle down. Now, it doesn't mean it's a bad place. You, we need to go through every one of these places. And do you know what's important? As we move on with God, we shouldn't knock the place we've been before. You know, when a child moves out of the playpen, we don't take that playpen and take an axe to it and chop it apart. We fold it up and leave it for another child to come along. These are places that everybody needs. That's right. That's right. These are places they needed protection at that stage, you see. Don't knock it. Don't try and take them further than they're ready. Just take them one step at a time. That's how we had to go. I know we get excited about what we're learning now, and I used to tell everybody what I was learning. As soon as the Lord showed me something, I called someone else on the telephone, and I knew it was just <laughs> because that was not where they were. That was not where they were. And praise the Lord. When God gives us revelation, you know it takes time for it to become rooted in us. My brother said last night some revelations the Lord showed him about before the great and terrible day of the Lord. He said the Lord showed him that many years ago, and it's rooted in His Spirit. If we share it immediately or just talk all about it, do you know what will be like trees with lots of leaves, very little fruit, very little fruit. We'll be flapping a lot, saying a lot, but not too much fruit. He wants that Word and what's been done in our hearts to be, be, be rooted in us. And He wants us to be stabilized and secure in that, so when we speak it forth in his time, and it is a time to speak it forth, believe me, and share it, it'll come across with a life experience, not just something that you've heard yesterday and you're sharing today. And so we want to move on with God here. He says, Jericho, he says, is not a place to settle down. You know, I've come to the conclusion there isn't a, isn't a place to settle down with God. They just, really, why they call the the children of Israel, wayfarers in the land. And that didn't mean they church hop every couple of days. And it didn't mean they didn't belong there. It meant they moved their tent every three days. This tent. This tent. There's no settling down. And you know, there will be always that pull, that pull of the earth, that pull of the flesh to settle down. You've come to a good place. And, you know, each realm, each one of these places is so big and so large. And it's just like when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, well, that was such an opening for me that I could hardly believe I'd been saved. And yet all those years I was. I real, I'd been born again when I was nine years old. I was brought up in an Episcopal home. And through an unusual series of circumstances, my mother sent me to a Salvation Army camp. Now, you had to know that's God. Mm-hmm. And they were aggressively evangelical, aggressively. 
And by the time I'd been there about five days, oh, I just couldn't wait to, till they stopped preaching till I could go forward and receive Christ. And I knew, I knew, I knew I'd been born again. I knew something had happened inside that had nothing to do with stained glass windows and padded pews, as lovely as they were. And you know, I went back to my Episcopal church, and I guess that's why the Lord had to register that so deeply in my heart because my parents didn't know what happened to me and they just continued to send me to the same place I'd gone before. And I knew that this uh, something was alive in me, something was different. But I was almost 30 before I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit because no one had ever told me there was such a thing of the Holy Spirit. And you know, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I thought, surely... Surely this is the end. This is the ultimate. Why? Because it was so much larger than what I had before. Right? So much larger. The Word began to open up to me. Until then, this Word was, I believed it and I read it, but it was kind of distant. It was kind of historical. You say, And I knew it was truth, but it did not speak to me now. Although I felt that God did want to speak to me, I didn't know how He would. But when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this word began to open up. And pretty soon I wasn't reading about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God was speaking to me. God was speaking to me. And I can truly say, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy words were unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. To eat this word, to eat it, it will be strength and life. And that was such a new thing for me. But I thought, surely this is the best thing. But then the Lord began to move us on very quickly. My husband and I often used to say, I wish we could have lingered a little longer at some of those places like some of our friends did. We kind of went past and some of them were still doing some nice things and, and, and really living a little more comfortably than we are. That's right. But you see, I don't understand it. God sees the heart. He sees what you've set inside to Him. And He begins to draw you on. He bring, begins to bring people into your life. When we first met Irma and Glenn, we came down here, was it about eight, nine years ago, maybe at least, and uh, uh, visited to them in their bookstore that they had over here in Hot Springs. And it turned out that we knew many of the same people that they had been fellowshipping with throughout the country. God had, li- He has His own way of linking it up. I don't know why we've met Brother Bell and Brother Agin and, and you all here and different ones. And I don't know. But we're linked together in the Spirit. We're linked together in the Spirit. I was telling my son last night, he was talking about different, uh, some things that, uh, uh, about Christians and some things he didn't understand. And I said, well, Daniel, it's hard to explain these different realms. But I said, Daniel, it's, it's, it's sort of like you come to a group of people and your spirit witnesses that this is where you belong. You may not have anything in common with them uh, or, or not a whole lot in common with them in the natural as far as how we get together in the natural. You know, you find out if you, where they lived and their background and their nationality and their jobs and their social position. That's how people get together in the natural realm. But in the spiritual realm, we know each other by the Spirit. We don't know each other after the flesh. And somehow or other, your Spirit bears witness that you belong. Our sisters in, from Memphis here, they came and they talked. They talked with you over the phone and then they came. We had prayed with them in Memphis. And you see, they come and for some reason or other, you may never have seen them before. They may never have seen you before, but they feel at home in the Spirit. They feel that as they hear the ministry going forth that registers with their spirit, their spirit rises up and says, Yes, this is the troop that I'm marching in. I don't know why I didn't choose it, but He chose us. And we need a flow where He's moving us. And He's moving us on. He's moving us on. And we can trust Him. We can trust Him. And so the two went on. Here we are at verse 6. Verse 7. And 50 men... Notice, just the two went on. Praise the Lord. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. Those two could also represent Joshua and Caleb of a former day. The remnant. Those that will go on. 
Now, I want you to know people are watching. You know people are watching your life. They may not tell you about it. It may not, you know, it may not be uh, something that you actually see them standing there, but they're watching your life. They're watching your life. They're going to see what happens to you. You know, over in Proverbs, there's a scripture, and the Amplified, it reads, As we go on in the way of life, we are a way of life for others. Now, just our walking and following the Lord, just going on, makes a way for others to come through. It's not necessarily that you always preach to them or teach them or bring them or tell them to come on. Just the fact that you're going through opens up a path in the Spirit for others to move into that realm. I'm glad some people did it that I could watch and be encouraged by their life. Or I might not be here today. Praise God. Praise God. And so the 50 men of the sons of the prophets, there they were again, and they stood to view afar off. They didn't get too near, but they were in sight. Uh, it says at the margin of my Bible, they were in sight. And he, I want you to know something about Jordan. I think they thought here, here we're going to find out. Because Jordan was known to have unusual currents and tides that were somewhat unpredictable. And it was usually rather muddy, even when it was low. This was not a place that uh, you would choose to go over. I want you to know what Jordan means. When you break that down, that word, jor and dan, jor means spreading and dan means judgment. And that's the spreading of judgment on our life. You know, judgment is starting at the house of God. Now, that doesn't mean the judgment of punishment. That's the judgment of correction. Judgment, in its, in its really literal sense, means setting things right. Setting things the way God wants them. That's what it means. And he's judging this self-life. This self-life. You know, our will. This is the place that he's challenging here. I want you to notice that at Gilgal, if you remember in your experience, and Bethel, and even at Jericho, when you got saved, when you received the Holy Spirit, and in deliverance services like we're going to have here, that there are people around to, to, to help you. And, and the, the organ and the piano are playing. And uh, softly and gently, Jesus is calling. Whatever. And people in full gospel businessmen praying. They're noted for praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Although I believe anywhere that the Spirit is moving... People can be saved, filled with the Spirit, and delivered. That's the way it should be. It shouldn't be we have to, you know, divide up into little places because the Spirit does it all. But I want you to know when you get to Jordan, that's where you lay it all down. And he deals with us individually. Nobody, it seems like this must be a decision deep within to go on. This is a judgment of the self-life. This is your surrender of your will to God totally and completely and unconditionally and you know he deals with each one I can only give my will to God and I, I have a hard enough time doing that can't even give you, so you can't give someone else's will to God because he's given it to everyone to choose to choose but he may be dealing with some here to say yes maybe he's been pressing you and moving on you and you know how the flesh is. We resist to the very end. Now, it's just the flesh. It's just the flesh of all of us. But God will strengthen your will to make that choice to go on. To go on. I want you to see what happens in verse 8. It says, And Elijah took his mantle, and he wrapped it together, and he smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. That tells me we're going to go over in victory, right? Firm, dry ground, not dragging our feet in the mud, not being tossed by the waves. I believe it. I believe it. And then it says, and it came to pass. Notice the timetable moves on. You've got to move with God. 
when they were gone over Jordan, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. You know, there's a lot of ministry going around and teaching around today that says, Ask what you want. You can have what you want. Have you heard it? You can have what you want. And you know you can at this point when your will and my will is one with his and not before. This question was not offered at Bethel. It was not offered at Jericho. It was not offered at Gilgal. It was not offered as they stood on the banks of Jordan as an incentive. We go on in faith believing then it was offered you notice in John 16 26 it says in that day what ye shall ask in my name it shall be given you and I believe that's the day the day is for each of us when our will is one with his and he says ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee and Elisha said, I pray thee. Notice what he asks for. Isn't that beautiful? He says, I pray, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Hallelujah. A double portion. And he said, Elijah said, thou hast asked a hard thing. I looked that up and I thought, that's strange. He asked, tell me what I'm to do for you. And then he said, you've asked a, law, a hard thing. And I know there's nothing too hard for God. Well, that really means thou hast done hard at asking me. Thou hast really gone all the way. Thou hast made a great claim. Do you know one of the reasons I feel in my own life and maybe in yours that we are begging and puny in our prayers is because we are not at this place of surrender and our will one with His. But when we are there it says uh, we can ask large I don't believe we should beg that I believe we ought to ask large and believe I really do yes it means that uh, thou hast made a great claim thou hast asked a great thing it's not that that is too hard for God there's nothing too hard for him nevertheless my goodness how many of us would still be get would be getting tired about this point on and on and on and on praise God he strengthens us every step of the way I believe it nevertheless if thou see me when I am taken from thee it shall be so unto thee but if not it shall not be so it looks like he's going to be tested for his faithfulness right to the end does it not right to the end that's good. And it came to pass as they still went on. Still going on. And they talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha, he saw it. He saw it. His eyes were open. He wasn't asleep. You know, the scripture says, Awake thou that sleepest, rise up. And that wasn't to the dead in the graves. That was to those on the pews. Awake. He wanted them to be awake and alert and seeing what he's doing. Seeing him. That's right. Really seeing him. It says, Elijah saw it. And he cried, My father, my father. And I believe that's the Abba Father of Romans uh, 8. It says, a chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof and there's all kinds of things we can go on into there but the point that I'm making here it says and when he saw him no more he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces and I think of that as a, his former garment the old garment rent the veil was rent right he was ready for a new garment wasn't he a new mantle praise the Lord he took also up, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he went back and he stood by the bank of Jordan. You know, when God blesses us, we need to immediately take it up. 
not there to be looked at. It's not there to be displayed. It's there to be used. In any realm, when God blesses us, it's not just to talk about. It's for use. It's for use for his kingdom, for others. And he took the mantle of Elisha that fell from him and he smote the waters. Wait, let's just see. He took the mantle that fell from him and he stood by the bank of Jordan. You know what? He wanted them to see him. Who? The sons of the prophets. Some have to see before they believe. And that's all right too. Thomas was included in that group. Some have to see before they believe. Where is the Lord God? He took the mantle of Elijah, verse 14, that fell from him. He smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. They, had, they saw, they believed, and they submitted. Praise God. I want you to know something that uh, God never said it would be easy, but he said he would be with us. Is that right? Amen. That's right. And that he'd give us joy in the midst of tribulation or in the midst of whatever he leads us in or leads us on into, or the processing that this takes through the natural circumstances of our life. But there has to be some, has something inside that says, Lord, I'm going to go on. Maybe you've sat at Gilgal for a while, and you've been somewhat discontent, somewhat dissatisfied, but, gee, it's comfortable. Or you've sat in the realm of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and uh, but somehow you think, Gosh, there there ought to be more. There ought to be more. There is. That means that there's a godly discontent where the time is that you've lingered too long that he creates by his spirit in your heart and mind that says there's got to be more than I'm experiencing now. And there is. There's always more. Say, Lord, just reveal yourself. Just keep on right before me and I'll go on. And he'll show us how to go. We've never gone this way before, but he'll show us. He'll show us. Sometime after I received the Holy Spirit, I, a friend of mine passed me some literature by a very precious brother from England. He'd come out of the Baptist church. He had pastored one of the largest cathedrals in England. One day he was preaching, and his sermons were good. He was a student of the Word. But he knew something was missing. And he said, Lord, something is missing. And the Lord says, look up. And he saw that beautiful dome of the cathedral. And he says, it's that dome, he said, that's hindering the open heaven. Now, it wasn't the physical dome. It was that ecclesiastical order. And he said, Lord, I want you. I want your fullness. I'll leave it all. This was the epitome of his career. The epitome of his career. He said he had passed by this cathedral as a little boy. He thought it was the most magnificent structure he had ever seen. Little did he ever believe that he would be the pastor there. He came to little groups. He traveled around. He became a teacher of Watchman Nee. We think of Watchman Nee if you've read any of his books or heard of him as an old man. Well, he went on to be with the Lord some 10, 12 years ago, and so did this brother. But he went to China and taught some Chinese brethren there. When he came to the United States, God was stirring in hearts. Do you know there wasn't a church that would open their doors to him? He had to go to camp meetings. Praise God. But he was faithful. One of the things that he said that has stuck with me through the years He said, if you can be stopped, you'll be stopped. If you can be stopped, you will be stopped. So this is only for those who say, Lord, I won't be stopped. I don't know how. I don't know where you're going to lead me. I don't know what you're going to do, but I trust you. It surely is a walk of faith. You can trust him. You can trust him. 
you can trust him. And the end is good. The end is good. The fruit is good. The fruit is good. The fruit is good. And so I want to challenge you in your heart. If God has ever spoken to you and, 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 and you, or you've been in a situation where you said, Lord, I will go. I will do whatever you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. I'm not talking about going to Africa. I'm talking about going on inwardly with God. And then there's no problem of where we're going to be placed. Say, Lord, you spoke to me. And I said, yes. And now you're drawing me a little bit further. Say, Lord, I'll take the next step. You're go- your spirit will go with you. The spirit will go with you. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He knows your frame and he knows mine. He knows exactly how to deal with us and love us and gently move us on. But he is looking for that response that says, I will, I will, I will. You know, everything with Jesus is, will you? He says, will you be healed? Will you? Will you go on? Let's bow our heads in prayer and let's just make this a little time of, of consecration, a time of saying, Lord, I've, there is more. The situations in my life, the problems in my life, my revelation, my walk, present walk is not enough to to keep me and move me in this situation I'm in now. I need more of you. I need to go on. If you're at Gilgal, that's a good place to be. There's nothing wrong. I said, Lord, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to ask this weekend for prayer that I might receive it. Ask and you shall receive. If you're here and the Holy Spirit has surfaced in your mind or you've been aware of problems in your life, say, Lord, I'm here. I'm going to ask for deliverance. I'm going to submit to the Spirit of the Lord through the brothers here that are going to minister and the sisters' deliverance. Yes. God is saying, Lord, I, if the Lord is saying to you, I, I want you to surrender just totally your will to me, that I would really be Lord of your life that you enter into that holiest place where I am all and in all. In you, through you, he will do that. He will do that. And I believe that as we move on, we're going to be dynamic in the Lord. We can ask for souls. We can ask for things largely, not just, not just individuals, but we can ask for, for nations. I believe God wants us to ask largely. Perhaps your will, and sometimes that's the case, Satan attacks our wills. We've purposed to go on in the inner recesses of our heart, and then things get hard, and, and just say, Lord, strengthen my will. We need to ask him sometimes to strengthen our will. Do you know he'll do that? It says it's God who is all the time at work within you, while you're working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and That's not trembling in a fearful way. That's an awesome thing to think that he's chosen you, he's drawn you, he's spoken to you, that you're here. says, but it's God that worketh in you. The Amplified says he is continually at work within you, both giving you the desire and the will to do his good pleasure. One translation says you don't have to do this in your own strength. He is strengthening your will. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Just let God work in your heart. Praise the Lord. Before my husband comes, could we sing I Surrender All? Could you come and sing? Do you know that song, I Surrender All? All to thee, my blessed Savior. I sang that for years, but I didn't know what it meant. Why don't we stand up and...
Lord, make it a prayer. Make it a prayer to God. Make it a prayer. His will is your highest good. His will is your greatest happiness and joy. Praise the Lord. Remain standing just for a short while. Stretch your legs a little bit. Something that Glenn was saying both yesterday and several other speakers as well as today is about a remnant. As you know, we have just, we've only moved twice in 27 years of marriage. And rather recently, we uh, have been trying to upholster some old chairs. And because of our tight budget, we would go into uh, places that sell remnants or discontinued stock. And it was rather interesting, and I got a little upset about this, because, you know, when you go into a store and you ask where the remnants are, they look down at you and say, they're over on that table over there. Go help yourself. And yet we're told a remnant? I mean, what in the world are they saying, really? And I go over to that table, and you know those remnants, they don't look too good. They're wrinkled and folded, plenty of wrinkles and plenty of folds and some oily spots on them. Oh, praise the Lord for the oil. And they're ragged edges. And you know why? They were the last spit on the bolt. And that bothered me, too. And praise the Lord for a wife that thoughts to ponder these things. Oh, she said, but honey, remember, that was the first part rolled on to that bolt. And so in God's foreknowledge, we were the first part rolled on to that bolt. And it's also the last part. There's a remnant at the end. That's We're right. Here. That's right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we are God's remnant. Have a seat. I would like to share just very briefly. You know, if you look at your schedule sort of for this convention... There's actually ten meetings, three deliverance meetings, and seven regular meetings. And I promise you, if you attend all the meetings, you will have received the opportunity to feast at God's table. There will be something for everyone at every level. And sometimes I think about repetition, because I have learned a little lesson about repetition that's most interesting. In Oklahoma, was one of the areas that we lived for about 10 years, I got involved because of my sons in an area of working with Christian camping groups or Boy Scout groups. And only once a year, I wish it would be more often, we would gather all the men. Uh, just the men would go out, and we would spend about four days in the woods together. And we were all spirit-filled leaders, and loved the Lord, and in the evening when it got dark, we would sit around in our campers or our tents and we would talk about things of the Lord. And most of these men came from various backgrounds. And they would say, you know, I never heard that before. Or I wish my church would have that, that kind of understanding or ministry. And every time they would thought in on that over the years, I would say, well, my dear brother, the, 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 uh, the pew cannot get higher than the pulpit. And I thought they would understand that. Next year, some other complaint would come up in our midst where they would say, you know, in my church, our pastor, he ministers on the same scripture verses all the time. And uh, I don't know, it's not good. And I would say to them that the pew cannot get higher than the pulpit. And then all of a sudden, about four or five years later, I was sharing the same thing, but this time I included a little vision. I said, you know, I said, I, you guys trust me enough for me to share this. It always sounds a little far out when I share a vision. But I said, you know, it's a blessed time when the Lord shows you something in the Spirit. And I said, I'm not even a musician. I don't know how to play any instrument. But all of a sudden the Lord showed me a vast orchestra, and the whole orchestra pit was there, and they were all tuning their instruments, and it was a, a discord of sound. And all of a sudden, out of the edge of the auditorium came a magnificent person dressed in white to lead that particular orchestra. And I got goose pimples all over because I realized it was the Lord. And he got out of that discordant notes. He got beautiful music. And then as I wondered on how this all happened, the Lord told me to look carefully. And I looked down at the instruments. And uh, there was a particular violist playing on an instrument. And I looked at it, and it looked peculiar. And the Lord says, look real close. And it's almost as if I had a binocular. 
I could see the most amazing thing. He only had one string on the instrument. And he was playing that one string very well, fingering it up and down and playing that string. And the Lord told me to look real close again. And on that string was all sorts of scripture verses. And he was playing those same scripture verses over and over again. And I looked at his face and I recognized him as one of these big evangelists of our day. And the next one, I recognized his face and his face. And they were all playing one string instrument. But praise God, there was a remnant. There were other musicians there who had many strings on their instruments. And they were playing the whole range of scriptures, the whole counsel of the Lord. You know, we sometimes come to a convention like this. Uh, we have afternoon meetings, which are deliverance meetings. Uh, then we have morning teachings, and we have afternoon, I mean, evening meetings, in which the Word comes across, in my opinion, very powerfully. And you say, what is the correlation? What is the relationship between deep, powerful teachings and ministry and deliverance? Uh, uh, how do you put the two together? Uh, deliverance is supposedly for people who have problems, and the other people are supposed to come for the deeper teachings which are going to make them better ministers or better witnesses. I think the secret is that the Lord is going to be able to purify and perfect the saints to do the work of God. And it's through deliverance that that perfection comes through. It's through the workings on our lives, as Brother Bell was saying yesterday. Watch me change. Boy, if that wasn't a statement for a minister to stand up and say, watch me change the next few days. I think everybody's going to be looking at you. Praise the Lord. You know that God does want us to change. And he speaks to us through God's word over and over again. Last night when we heard about the 30, 60, and 100 fold, repeatedly, I sat there excited because some of the sharing that I thought the Lord would have me to share is along those lines. And I got a confirmation from my brother who was flowing in that realm of the Spirit. You know, many years ago, before I was called into the ministry, I was a designer and builder of houses and shopping centers and garden apartments. And the Lord called me into the ministry. I didn't know what I would do, but the Lord allowed me to design churches and orphanages and travel to 14 foreign countries. Whatever my hand found to do, I would do it as unto the Lord. The Lord blessed. But one of the passages of Scripture that came alive, Lily read an area that came alive to her. And one of the areas that have come alive to me is in the area of building. You know, way back in Second Chronicles of the Old Testament, they were building a temple. And I've shared that here before, but there's parts of that which is most important. When our brother called one little phrase last night, and he was talked about clothing humanity with gold. Whee! I said, praise the Lord. That's what he's doing. Let me share just briefly as an outline. And then as time comes on, for these next <clears throat> seven uh, services, I will share other parts of this. But you know that temple, every color, every dimension, every material has a meaning in God's Word. And it just takes God's revelation to bring it forth. And as our brother Rhett mentioned words and expressions out of God's Word, that for years we had taken wrong. God wants us to understand it from a deeper realm. And in the building of this temple, the outer walls were made of stone. Praise the Lord. That could be a, a, a realm of the Spirit. The inner walls were covered with wood, a certain kind of wood, a certain special wood. And on top of those particular planks of wood, God covered it with pure gold. Three basic building materials and perhaps a tie-in with the 30, 60, and 100 fold, if your mind will open yourself to visualize it as such. Lily, you talked about resting at a particular realm of the Spirit. Uh, do you know, when we were in that miry clay, when we were in, out there in the fields, out in the miry clay, God came in a special way and plucked us out of the miry clay. And uh, you know, these outer walls of stone, those stones came the same way. They were dug out of the miry clay. They were hosed down and cleaned up. Maybe it's a baptism of water. I don't know. And they were dumped on the construction site. And many times I saw those stones 
jumped on a construction site to see the, the foreman direct the people working under him to start cleaning up those stones. Wow, that's deliverance, isn't it? And he would pick up those stones, and if there was something that was wrong, something bad, he would give it a whack, and that piece would be severed from that stone. And they would start to shape those stones. And in the Old Testament, they didn't have the instruments we have today. And so they had to measure it up on a perfect stone. And that perfect stone was Jesus Christ. And they would put that stone on it to see how it would square up. And they would keep whacking at that stone until it would shape up and, sh and, shape up and conform to that chief cornerstone. And do you know those big whacks that we sometimes take we wonder what the Lord is doing in our lives. But you know, sometimes those big whacks is not as hard as the little chipping that takes place. And the Lord will cause, he will direct those men to keep on chipping and chipping until that stone really starts to take shape. Uh, then one thing he will do, he will take those two stones and he will place them together, one on top of the other, and grind away. And let me tell you, there's where the sparks fly. Now, it could be in a church. You can have a... Oh, yeah, it could be your wife as well. I see somebody patting his wife on the back. That's true. Let me tell you, that's where the sparks fly. Praise the Lord. And you know, just to get the rough spots out of our lives. But there comes a time when that stone has been ground down on all surfaces. And you think it's ready to be used. And the Lord has a final, most beautiful way. He takes that stone... And he puts it on his work table. And only the master, uh, the master of masonry man, or the master stone cutter, does this work. Under a flood of water, using pumice, a substance that has gone through the fire, he polishes the surface of that stone. And you know, through the washing of the water of the Word, our lives are going to be polished. And we will start to reflect our, our Christ. We will start to reflect who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as that stone is being polished, all of a sudden that master stonemason will put up his hand and he will take it and he'll wipe the surface of that stone and he will look in and he will know when that stone is finished, when he sees the reflection of himself. Oh my, praise the Lord. Can people see Christ in you? I stopped off some time ago with my camper and had uh, some gas put in it. And the young man who was pumping gas, I took one look at him. And I said, praise God, I see you're a Christian. And that shook the kid up all over the place. He says, mister, what are you saying? I said, I can see you're a Christian. Oh, he said, you made my day. He said, I've only been saved two weeks. And I didn't know it showed already. <laughs> what is that? The Lord shining through our faces so that we would know that we are part of the family of God. And you know the Lord takes those stones after they're polished. You know, praise God, He will place those stones in His temple, mind you, so that the best surface faces the world. He's a gentleman. If the Lord only uh, showed the world some of the other facets of our lives, it wouldn't be too attractive, would it? But He lets the best surface face the world. And he allows the rest of that stone to grow. If you remember back there in Peter, he said, We are lively stones. We are growing stones, fitly framed together. And so there, without mortar, without man-made substances, we are allowed to grow together to be knit into the temple, the house of the Lord that he is building. And do you know... And very often there are places in that particular building where he has to place special stones. Now, we understand that chief cornerstone. But there are other corners as well. And they have to have two surfaces that God has polished through the years. A brother who had all of a sudden got an understanding there in the Assemblies of God 20 years ago, 1957, almost 30 years ago. My goodness. God started to work on that surface of his life. And then when that surface was did, he saw to polish another surface. And then he placed it in the corner. You talk about sons of God, we could be easily cornerstones. 
Not the chief cornerstone, but we could be cornerstones. And that mason will stretch a line between my brother at one end of the building and maybe Glenn on one other corner and myself on another corner and he will fill in the stones in between. Precept by precept, God is building his temple. And we have that privilege of allowing the Lord to work on us, allowing people to chip away at us, allowing ourselves to be exposed to deliverance in this afternoon service, to allow the Lord to lift out anything that's not pleasing unto him. And do you know, on every construction site, there's a stone that the builders always reject. I mean, they say, Jose, put it over there. Joe, leave it there. That stone doesn't fit. And it's a stone the builders rejected. But you know, as that building goes up, four square, praise the Lord, and then it starts coming up to a peak, all of a sudden, there is a need for one last stone, and that's at the very top. And it's a triangular stone. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And this triangular stone has five surfaces, the fivefold gift to the churches. But it's a stone that the builders have rejected. But all of a sudden, it's the finishing stone. It's the capstone on God's temple, on God's house. And it's Christ Jesus. He's that cornerstone, and he's, he's that finishing stone. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. He is building that temple today. You know, in that cornerstone, when we put them in when we were in the building industry many years ago, do you know that cornerstone is hollow? And we builders make very peculiar traditions, but in that hollow cornerstone, we will place a little lead or steel box. And in there, we will put a newspaper, we will put a wristwatch, we'll put a, a Sears and Robux catalog, we will put all sorts of peculiar trinkets in there to show people thousands of years from now, if this world holds together, the kind of civilization we lived in. And so we'll put all sorts of little bits of information. You know what my Bible says? That Christ Jesus, in him is hid all knowledge and all truth. He is that cornerstone. You know, I'm going to close in a couple of minutes. I could spend two hours just talking about the stones in this. But the most exciting thing is, is that a realm that you are working through, that you are being processed through. The temple wasn't just built with stones. There is more. There is more. There is more. There's never any end to what the Lord is doing. And the inside walls were lined with wood. Now, I want to share that in one of the next times. That wood wasn't mahogany. It wasn't oak. It wasn't all of the wood. Years ago, I owned a lumber yard, and about 90% of the wood I bought, 95%, was sappy wood. All wood had sap in it. In fact, most of the people I met in those days were sappy people. Yeah? And do you think God is going to line his temple with sappy wood or sappy people? No. He used only one kind of wood. I have a lumberman back there. And he used cedars of Lebanon. Why did he use cedars of Lebanon? Because there's not a drop of sap running through it. Nothing but oil. Hallelujah. Nothing but oil. And it depends where the cedars of Lebanon grow up in our rear. And I'll talk about that the next time. Which cedars of Lebanon have the most oil? Now, do you know that oil? Oh, my. When that is made into planks, your grandma or grandpa might have had a cedar closet. Why do they spend money lining a cedar closet? Because the aroma of the oil, the aroma of that anointing would repel the enemy. Praise the Lord. And you can rest on that realm. But then you can go on to see those cedars of Lebanon covered with pure gold. So we're going to talk about these other realms of the Spirit. Sufficient for this morning has been what we have received already. Lily has shared very strongly that we are to press on. We are to press on to go through Jordan to that promised land. And if you want to settle down, you can settle down. For a long while, I thought I was settling down in a little town of Tyranza. We had a good, a tiny little church. We were building a lovely home for ourselves. 
But there must be something in our ministry or something in our sharing that the Lord wanted us to share with other people. And it was the funniest thing about the whole thing is that the, one of the main reasons, the only reason that the people didn't like us is because Lily and I couldn't feed them. Four years we poured out and the six or seven families we had didn't feel that we could feed them properly. Maybe they were right, but I think the Lord allowed that to happen to thrust us out again into a time of teaching and ministry because we know out there there are the sons of God. They're out there. Every time I share even a full gospel, I don't share a full gospel just because I am interested tremendously in that realm of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in that realm, there will be dozens of people who have a hunger to go beyond. Lily will minister to women's groups and women's of low particularly. And you know, she does it not because 60, 70 women come together for prayer, for deliverance, for need, but in that realm, she finds a mother of Zion, a handmaiden of the Lord, someone who has made that commitment to go all the way with the Lord, to make the Lord the Lord of their lives. So you ponder these things now during the day, the quiet hours between the meals, between the gatherings, and you ask, ask the Lord just to open your heart and your life to the processing of the Lord. He wants to work on each of us. He wants to work on us as lively stones to polish us so that we can have a, re a reflection of Jesus Christ, that we truly can be made in his image and after his likeness. Let us rise and let you come and close this morning session. In Jesus' name. Yeah, we'll do two things here. Father, I thank you for your presence amongst us. I praise you for it. Thank you for your anointing. The rest on those who minister and those who listen. Open our hearts to understand the word of the Lord and to receive it and to hide it in our hearts then that we sin not against thee. And I thank you for it. Father, I thank you for the food we're about to receive. I bless it. And Father, I thank you for the offering that we're going to receive. And now at this time, Lord, for to help with the finances here and to help with the burden of this place and to take care of those who've come to minister. And I thank you for your anointing to rest on, the, on that as it does on the rest of the service. And I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Where the angels call him Jesus, born of a virgin, Mary called him Jesus, but I call him Lord. Yes, the angels call him Jesus, born of a virgin. Mary calls him Jesus, but I This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.